Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest. We've got Steve Libin. Steve, appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate that. Absolutely. So a little bit on how uh, Steve and I know each other. We both uh, were, were speakers at a multifamily conference last year in Charlotte and um, got to spend some time together and he's doing great things. And so I asked him to come on the show and share with listeners. And with that, um, can you share how many properties and how many units uh, you're currently invested in? Yeah, so we have, oh, about 11 properties, about 2,400 units. We exited probably 1,000 units last year before the market started to get um, real silly. So That's good timing, man. It was good timing. Good timing, <laughs> right? No crystal ball here. We just happened to start getting some silly offers. As you know, people were paying compressed cap rate prices and... We decided to exit a few of those deals and it, yeah, it ended up working out really well. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, you guys, can you share a little bit on, on your focus, both geography and I know that you're, you're big on impact investing. Talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah. and we'll go from there. Yeah. So we, uh, we recently launched in December, a hundred million dollar equity fund. It's, um, attributed to four different asset classes, student, senior, storage and multi so multifamily is really our most bullish asset class we are looking for operators to partner with in the senior housing space we've done storage before so we've included it in the fund but we don't have any storage in there currently we sold about four hundred thousand square feet last year of that um, and then student we're actually pretty bearish on student housing except at division one football schools so oh, nice. I think I think the education um, education is changing, right? Like people through COVID learned that they could do more homeschooling, they could do more online classes, they don't have to necessarily go to the big school. So I think even with my kids, you know, my my oldest is only nine, but unless she's going to be a doctor or a lawyer, I don't know if she's going to do the campus life. Um, that being said, you can't replicate a Clemson USC game unless you're at Clemson. So we right. we do purchase uh, student housing complexes at Division One football schools specifically. But outside of that, we're kind of bearish on on the student market. So um, that's huge. I didn't realize that you had that large of a fund, a $100 million fund. That's, that's, a, that's a large fund. So yeah, most of the syndicators that have come on have been you know, syndicate the syndication model, like one asset or maybe multiple assets, but in one syndication deal. Um, sure. I have had a few people come on and talk about the fund structure, but I'm, I'd like to delve into that a little bit more. Like, so one, why did you start going down? Did you ever do the syndication model, you know, versus on the straight asset? Why did you go to fund and then kind of how'd you, grow it to be a hundred million. I mean, that's, that's huge. Yeah. So we did do the syndication model to start. So previous to multifamily, we, we got started in the residential space. So we were wholesalers 12 years ago. Um, so we did some wholesaling and then we did flips. We flipped about a thousand properties and then we moved into the commercial wow. space after somebody said, Hey, um, you should go buy an apartment building. You'll pay less in taxes. And we were getting slaughtered in taxes with the single family flips because we're paying ordinary income. Plus, uh, we're in New Jersey, so New Jersey state income tax on top of it. So the government was our biggest partner at 44%. It's really wow. killing us. And um, and we just didn't know what we didn't know, right? And we started in, I, I was a real estate broker first, and then we did uh, wholesales and flips. And then one of my buddies said, you should go buy an apartment complex because there's depreciation benefits that... So I started reading Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright nice. and started talking to some CPAs and then finally just grabbed a copy of the tax code and started reading through it and saying, is this true? 
are there tax benefits for multifamily investors that don't exist in the single family space? And as you know, there are. And we were able to mitigate a large tax burden from almost seven figures a year to zero. I mean, wow. this year will be negative 2.7 million. Um, and that was when I had the aha moment that, you know, I think we built the wrong widget. And we, we <laughs> hey, shut at least down. You, at <laughs> least you learn and then you pivoted, right? So we learned a lot. And, uh, you know, there's stories upon stories in the single family space. Um, but once we got into, we, so we decided to get into multifamily and we actually built three self storage facilities managed by CubeSmart down in Florida with an experienced operator. We raised the capital, they operated and we joined forces and, um, that was our first foray into commercial. Our first deal actually was 1,183 unit ground up self storage facility. It was Holy a pretty, cow. pretty big deal. And, uh, we got our depreciation that year and recognized that, okay, we should be doing this full time. So that was the pivot. So then we start. so those so deals that were first self storage deal was, it was a syndication model. It was a syndication. Okay. So we brought $4 million through syndication to the deal. It was, um, $12 million total build on 14 acres. And we brought in maybe 35 investors, you know, average investment rate was like a hundred grand and it was a 506 B syndication. And then we did that again, um, six months later to build another one. So the first one that you did were the, were you bringing the investors over that were investing in your wholesaling business? Yeah, they were already investing in our single family flips. Okay. So, you know, they were used to coming in and getting a, a return uh, against, um, you know, as kind of preferred equity, essentially. So we would get either a hard money loan or they would do the whole deal for the whole house. And, and then we were educating them exactly what we were learning about. You know, I'd call one of my investors up and say, hey, you know, we really appreciate you doing these deals with us. We were paying you, you know, eight to ten percent as a first mortgage deed, and we were flipping houses. But every time I returned their capital, they'd say, "When's the next deal? When's the next deal?" We were only right. deploying capital for six months at a clip. I said, "So we're going to pivot um, our business model. I hope you come along with us. We're going to now go into these deals. They're going to be three to five years, so your money's going to continue working for you without you having to get it back." And then. Because, you know, if you do the math and you're paying somebody 10% on first mortgage, but you can only deploy it eight months out of the year, you're not giving them 10%, right? right it's like right. six and a half. Right. So getting to keep that capital working for you as an investor is super important. So they followed us willingly. They, they liked the, what the model was that we were going to be doing. And they said, okay, yeah, we'll go. We'll still do some single family stuff, but then we'll also put more diversification into passive long-term investments. That's that's an interesting point that you bring up that that – uh, 10% return because I think of like if somebody was going from the single family to multifamily that they may have issues with, Hey, my money's going to be tied up for three to five years. And yet you kind of flipped it on its head. Like your money's going to be working for you for three to five years versus, you know, going back and forth. Right. Cause there was, there's that loss of income through just having your money back, waiting for me to close on my next deal. Even if it's one or two months out of the year, Right. It still decreases your return profile. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so now you did the first one, a syndication. The second one, you did another syndication. How how'd you end up moving into the fund structure? So we actually did eight deals eight through syndication. Deals. Wow. And um, so in, in these syndication models, you get a deal under contract. You work really, really hard to go find a deal, right? kiss a lot of frogs, finally get something under contract. And then it's like, okay, boom, now we got to go raise this capital and we have 45 to 60 days to do it. Right. And it turns your hair a little white, you know, I mean, you have hard money up, you have a closing deadline and you know, it's, um, it's just, it's, it's a stressful race to the finish line. So there was two real big reasons why we switched to the fund model. The first was the idea is to raise enough capital and get enough capital commitments so that we can commit to deals based on the commitments that we have. So we know that we have, you know, 25 million committed in our $100 million fund and we're taking commitments in every day. And then the next round, the next deal that we have, we know that we have X amount of dollars to deploy. So get out in front of it a little bit 
in right. terms of, okay, we have commitments. Now we know what deals we could do. So that's the plan, right? We just launched it in December. It's March now. Uh, has this not is the happened. First fund. This is our first $100 million fund, right? Yeah. Everything else before that was syndication. And so, so the goal was to get out in front of the capital raise a little bit. Right. It hasn't happened yet. We keep saying yes to deals. So that is a little, there hasn't been the lag that we've hoped for yet. But You we're say yes, that, and then you're scrambling to, to get the still into the fund so you have, have the absolutely. capital. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, the goal is to make sure that we do get in front of that. It's only been a couple of months. And uh, so that was reason number one. Reason number two is a little bit different than I think a lot of syndicators or operators will tell you. And that's, we did a SWOT assessment, right? Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. So when you do a SWOT assessment, you're basically looking at all four of those different sectors of the business. And when you get to threats, you have to be real honest with yourself. And even though we owned and operated $150 million worth of property, we recognized, this was two years ago, we recognized that a recession was coming. We thought interest rates would not stay this low for this long. And when we when we said, hey, what's the biggest threat to my money? Because we invest in our own deals and my investors' money. And the answer was us as operators. We hadn't been in market cycles long enough on the commercial side. Now, if we needed to, we would have never said that it was a threat to our business on the residential side because we'd been through slowdowns and recessions and downturns. Right. On the commercial side, we'd only been it for five years and we knew that it was a good five years, right? Everybody's right. making money um, and things were good. And we just had the outlook that we really need to figure out how to partner with institutional operators, meaning guys that have been in business for at least 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, ideally, have at least $500 million worth of assets under management, ideally a billion. And partner with those types of operators who have seen slowdowns, recessions, downturns, high interest rates, right? I love the guys that we partner with that were working in 88, 89 when they were dealing with eight, 18% interest rates because they know how to deal with six and a half percent interest rates. Right, right. Um, and that was the honest assessment that we had to do to determine, hey, let's just be a fund. Let's go. We're good at investor relations. We're good at managing other managers and partnering with these institutional quality operators will really mitigate our downside risk. And that was the decision that was made. We said, okay, yeah, let's not operate the day to day anymore. Let's just start on the fund side and manage the managers. So that's interesting. I didn't realize that was going to be the, the answer. I, I was thinking that you set up a fund and you were still operating, but you're setting up a fund and then you are partnering with other operators. Yep. So we co-GP on every deal and our fund brings the entire check amount in a limited partner position. So the fund is not a profit center for us. We don't make any money through the fund. A tr like a traditional fund typically will pay, you know, they'll, they'll operate with you, Darren, as the operator and we'll say, okay, we're going to bring all the money. This is the type of waterfall that we want to see. These are the hurdle rates. And then we'll arbitrage the difference between what you're paying us in the fund and then what we pay the investors. Right. Um, that's not how we have it set up. Our, our investors bring the entire LP stack and then we co-GP on the deal. And our structure is a little bit different so that it's more economically advantageous for the, um, for the operator to partner with us than in a traditional waterfall model. Help me understand that. So I'm thinking, okay, you're getting a piece of the GP and that's, so you're getting a piece of the promote. That's how you guys make money. You're not, you're not, you don't have an extra split in the, in the fund structure. Um, oh. The LPs are getting the same return that they would get if they were going direct to the operator. Um, so our structure is a little different. It always has been because we started in the residential space. So okay. because we were paying 8 to 10%, our investors were used to lower returns. We've never pitched 18 to 20% per annum returns. We've always pitched. So the way our, our uh, fund is structured for accredited investors only. So can't, 
This is not a pitch to sell securities. Uh, <laughs> but the way that we structure our limited partners is they make a 6% preferred return through cash flow. Right? We all know this. There's two ways to make money in real estate investments. You have cash flow, you have a forced appreciation. So 6% in a preferred position through cash flow. Another 6% in a preferred position that accrues until the exit of the deal. Right? So essentially, we have a 12% preferred return, which is a little bit higher than most, but leaves a lot more meat on the table for the general partnership. Gotcha. Gotcha. So they also have a profit participation of between 5 and 15% of the total uh, sale profit proceeds at the end. But we're targeting 14 to 16% returns for our limited partners. And in this volatile oh, I'm market... Sorry. So they, they're getting something on top of the 12%? Yeah, they get typically a... 5 to 15% kicker on the exit of the property. Okay. And what about in terms of, um, is this preferred equity or are you? Are you... The 12 is pref. Okay. And then the, um, the equity kicker is based on the total profit. Very cool. So, so now talk about your... Well, I don't know. Was there more to, to add there, or, or? Well, I was just going to say. So, if you you know apples to apples, it's it's difficult to compare. So you have to model both out to make sure that it makes sense. But these operators typically make a little bit more by working with us, and that's why we have all the deal flow that we have. I mean, we turn down two, three hundred million dollars with a deal flow a week that penciled to seventeen plus IRRs. That, you know, it's a good spot to be in because everybody, you know, with with uh, proceeds being cut on the on the lender side, you know, being a pref equity provider is a is a good place to be because everybody's looking for how how do I make this deal work? Yeah. And if if you can, um, you know, provide an all in lower, you know, cost to the operator, that's advantageous. So and talk even to the LPs, right? The LPs they have a twelve percent floor. So in this season of capital preservation, where we don't want to deal with the volatility of the market, we're finding a lot of LPs that have a lot of cash sitting on the table. They don't want to do bond ladders. They're, you know, banking system, obviously, conversations that have been having. So a 12 pref to them is like, man, I'm making double digit solid returns and, and you as the operator don't get paid until I make my 12%. That's starting to look pretty, pretty sweet in this market. Right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what what do the operators look like? What's your your kind of um, sweet spot for who you like to work with? Yeah, so 10, 10 minimum years in, invested, ideally 20. Um, we like to see at least 10 exits, you know, 500 million plus under management, um, operating in the Sun Belt. So, so and then core you... value fit, right? I mean, everything's great in terms of numbers and and um, and values, but you know, core values, the people that you like to do business with, the people that align with your kind of not just investment ethos, but kind of familial moral value compass, I think is super important. We've done plenty of deals in the past with people that we probably wouldn't do deals with again, because um, when stress reveals the true character of people and this business has its stresses and i think there's a lot of people out there that talk a really good game about how to create partnerships and you know core value alignment and all those things but until it hits the fan you're not really sure who that person is and then you really see their true character come out and uh we've met some really incredible operators that you know, they, they don't lose their head. They don't lose their mind. They have a plan of attack. We execute on that plan. And it's not to say nothing ever goes wrong. It's how do we deal with it when it does go wrong? Right. Right. Like, who are the guys you want to be in foxholes with? Those are really the, we like to get face to face with everybody that we're going to do business with. And we're not a Wall Street firm. It's family owned and operated. It's me and one business partner and all of our family capitals in it too. So, you know, we want to make sure that the, uh, that the people, the, the human element of it is, is something that resonates with us that's huge um so the, you said you have one business partner how did you you and that and your business partner come together yeah so interesting story my wife when she was a kid got attacked by a dog 
and she uh, needed plastic surgery. It's a weird. It. It's a weird place to start the story. <laughs> it's a weird place to start. So when we got married, we adopted a black lab pit bull mix, and it was a puppy, and we rescued this dog, and uh, it started chewing on my wife a little bit, as puppies do, and she freaked out. She went right back to the place of when she was attacked. So we were like at this crossroads of what do we do? We got to get rid of this dog. She's not going to be able to mentally, you know, deal with this. Sure. And somebody said, hey, before you do that, why don't you go out to this guy's house? He trains puppies for a living. He's really good at it. Or he does it on the side. He's really good at it. We went out there. And after six or seven weeks, I started talking to the trainer that was there and found out that he was doing some underground utility work. He was digging ditches and putting in pipe. And he was, his family was in real estate. And, and his name was Travis. And he was training my dogs. And we just hit it off. And I was a real estate agent at the time. And we started talking about, well, hey, have you ever done any flips? Have you ever done any wholesale deals? Have you ever done any developer buyouts? And And we became friends. And we would get together on the weekends. And we'd have a bottle of wine and talk about, hey, you know, it would be pretty cool if we did this thing together. And um, we wrote a, a loose business plan on how to wholesale and flip properties. And tragically, he lost a friend of his who was only 28 years old and she oh, passed wow. a fourth, you know, stage four cancer at a very young age. And at that time, we were, we were doing our first wholesale. We, we both worked full-time jobs, but we decided to do a wholesale deal by with each other. We made $16,000 on that deal. We split the money, 8K to him, 8K to me. And he just lost and buried his friend. And he said, you know, I'm going to go to Costa Rica to surf for a month. And he called me from Costa Rica after two weeks. And he said, hey, you and your wife got to get down here. And uh, we flew down there. And he said, look, we already have the business plan. Uh, I think life is too short to work for anybody else. What do you think? And we both came home. We both quit our jobs, burned the boats, and started our business. And that's kind of the origin story of when me and Travis got to meet. That's awesome. Um, I think that's inspiring, too, for, for listeners that, look, at the end of the day, because I, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of people that ask me, like, well, I don't, I'm new to this world, and how do, you know, what value can I provide? You know, here's a guy who was training dogs, you know, like, but he was a good guy, and like it, he he built trust with you, and you guys decided to build a business together, and yeah. and he obviously has has held up his his end of the bargain. You guys have grown uh, tremendously together, and um, I I love stories like that. I love yeah. I love when people take a chance on somebody that doesn't necessarily fit the you know check all the boxes, um, but you just have that gut feel that this person is gonna you know, is going to make it They're They've got grit and, um, that's it, right. That grit and perseverance and like, yeah, you know, he knew the ugly end of a shovel plenty of times. And we've been in flips where we were scraping windows at 11 o'clock at night with razor blades after we painted them. And, and now, yeah, now we have, you know, he's helping, he runs the underwriting and asset management side of the business and, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of real estate. And, it's been incredible to see just kind of how we have both grown together. Growth is a core value of both of ours. So we don't sit in one place very long and we're reading, we're learning, we're growing, we're trying to find mentors. And, uh, and yeah, that's been, it's been everything. He's, you know, now we're family. That's huge. Um, and the fact that, you know, I was just at a, at a party this weekend and talking to a guy who's, uh, he's a sea level guy. Um, smart, smart guy. And he, and he's just like, you know, the people that are successful, they are, they're learners. They're, they're curious. They're always trying to, you know, get to the next level and, and they're not, you know, looking back as much as they're looking forward and how, how they can continually have more impact. And, um, you know, you surround yourself with those people and then you just naturally become like that. But it's amazing how many people just, and I'll let, let life push them around. That's it. They'll just stay in the same place for a long time. And, you know, I never realized how prevalent that was. You know, what was really eye-opening is when we started interviewing people for the business, I would always ask as one of my interview questions, what's the last book you read? And, man, some of the answers are <laughs> shocking. <laughs> like, I haven't picked up a book since high school. To one, one guy told me he watches the news every night. And I was like, yeah, but I wanted to know what the last book you 
read was he's like, oh, I don't have time to read. I just watch the news. And I was like, wow, man, what a what a skewed sense of perception that will give you if right. all you're doing is watching the negativity on the news all the time. Right. So yeah, it's uh, it's very interesting growth orientation for my wife too. I mean that that's such a core value. You want to be around people that are growing and learning, and and you also have to be humble enough to know that you don't know everything so that you can grow and learn. So that's uh, kind of the other side of growth is is humility because you can't think you know everything and still be a, a good learner. Yeah, abso- absolutely. And you know, I I've, I've got two kids in college now, and you know, I say to them, you know, look, it's a bummer when you're in high school or college. Like you, you're forced to learn, and you like some subjects and you don't like others. But when you get out, like it's all on you, like. You could you could be the guy that never picks up another book, you know, or you yep. could be the guy who's like, look, I'm interested in this, and so I'm gonna go learn from other people that have already done that. And that was and the hardest thing for me was getting out of college and kind of stagnating for a little bit. Um, I wasn't a business owner, and what hit me was somebody told me they're like, you know, you you don't grow automatically anymore. And I said, what do you mean by that? And you know, in high school and college you almost feel like you're growing automatically because you're forced to learn those things. So when you're done with it, at least for me, I was like, oh good, I'm not being told what to learn anymore. Right. But then as I got into sales roles and I wanted to become a better salesperson, I would start reading some sales books, you know, some some books on persuasion and some books on, you know, just kind of sociology, how people interact. And I really started loving that and going, oh wow, I can learn whatever I want now. Nobody's gonna tell me but there is that period of time where you need to recognize you're not going to grow automatically either. You have to have a desire, have a passion, and want to, to pursue something to learn. So figuring out what that is is an interesting process too. Absolutely, and it can change and, and morph as you go along. But, hey, you mentioned business owner. Um, I want to get your take on something. So, you know, I asked somebody that I know, it's actually a family member, not my, in my family, in my wife's family, that, it was very well to do and and asked him like do you know anybody who just became wealthy by saving w2 oh. employee and then save so do you know anybody that falls into that category he said no so i would say i would say no by saving alone do i know w2 employees that took those savings and invested them wisely so that they could become wealthy. Absolutely. 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 If you invested it in, you know, in, in assets that can appreciate um, dramatically and, and, you know, we're focused on cash flowing assets um, that have tax incentives as well, which, which is huge. But, um, you know, I think about it and I'm like, you know, the people that, that really have gotten wealthy have invested They've built businesses. Some of them have gotten lucky and have been, you know, in the right tech company and got stock options. Yeah, you know? sure. Um, you know, but it's typically something that you can sell. That something that has value. Um, you, you're an owner of something versus just putting your money. You know. 10% yeah, I saw this, you know, you see it circulating on social media from time to time where people are like, I've never known anybody that got rich by not going to Starbucks today. And that's kind of a pot shot at Dave Ramsey, right? Because Dave is yeah. the, he's, but, so two things on, on Ramsey. One, I disagree with him on some things. And two, I think he serves a really important purpose in today's America because we are a nation of debtors. Right. And... I would say that for 80% of the population, he's probably doing a great service because people just do not know how to manage money. So they need these very simple tactics and truths. And frankly, when I got married, I did the Dave Ramsey um, envelope system right before we we were (laughs) newly married. We were 24 years old. Like we needed to figure out how to budget. and Sure. uh, but he stops short, right? He stops short of how to create wealth. And, you know, if he's, if you listen to him long enough, you'll hear him say that he, you just put your money into a 10% mutual fund and you'll be in great place, in, in a great place and buy your real estate cash and all that stuff. And 
it's almost like he sloughs it off as like that's what you do if you get ever get there. But that's not what he does. You know, nobody's right, right, right. What he does is different, love. different than what. But you know what? He's created a niche, you know, for taking, like you said, I mean, it's probably 80 percent of the people. There's there's a lot of people that would say, look, what Steve does, that's, you know, for a different group. I you know, I I'm not in that group, you know, right. That, for people who invest in syndications, there are people that are like, oh, that's too complicated. You know, like that's right. for other people. And yet people like, I don't know what he invests in, but I'm sure I'm, I'm guessing he's in the private markets as well as, <laughs> as being in mutual funds. There's um, no but, doubt that he's in right. real estate and things yeah. like that. But so anyway, so I think he solves a good problem. But no, I think what he teaches people in terms of like you can save and be, be a millionaire. That's probably true, right? The millionaire next door is, um, you know, they gained a lot of popularity now. But, you know, a million dollars today isn't a ton of money. I mean, I don't know a lot of people that could retire with a million dollars in the bank and not actually be counting down the days until they run out of money. Right. So unless it's in a decent interest bearing account. I mean, I have pastors that have invested with us and they'll put a you know million dollars of savings after 40 years of working into a deal like this and they can live off of the you know sixty seventy eighty thousand dollars a year in cash flow and not touch their principal balance i think um if you put it in volatile stock markets you know I, so back to dave ramsey talking about 10 percent mutual funds the morning star average is like 3.4 percent in 401ks and six percent outside of 401ks so can you find it i i don't know i've emailed a show a few times asking what the name of the ten percent mutual fund is, but I haven't gotten a response. You, you haven't gotten the response. No, I haven't. So, talk about some uh, some learning lessons. Like you know, you've did eight syndications before this this fund. Um, you know, my experience. I'm a, I'm an LP and a GP in a lot of different deals, and my experience is that not every deal goes up in a straight line. There, no. You know, so there are hiccups along the way. So, you know, if you could share some. Yeah, be lessons. wary of the operators that don't share the failures. I think uh, if everybody always has rose, I, I have rose colored sunglasses on, but I surround myself with a team of people that tell me what the reality is all the time as well. So I think the biggest learning lesson in just the multifamily space for me in general was um, picking bad partnerships. Right, liking liking somebody in the initial conversation and going, oh, we should do a deal together, and then all of a sudden we're in a deal together, and they didn't have the operational expertise that we needed when we were asking for reporting. It was always late, or you know, trying to shine what was good on the property and kind of eliminate what was bad with the property. When I mean, operators can't put that stuff under the rug. So I think picking the right people that embody your core values and. You know, I teach um, entrepreneurship at a local homeschool co-op for a bunch of homeschool kids. And I start every single semester with the same conversation about core values. And it's like, hey, you got to come up with the, the three to five values that you value over everything that are deal breakers for you. We hire, we fire, we promote, and we demote on these core values. And if you don't embody them, we can't do business together. And then you have to figure out how to get somebody to not just wag their head at you and say, yeah, I embody those core values. You have to have some litmus tests for it too. Um, but if you can find kind of your tribe of people, I, life goes so much smoother. Not that the deal goes smoother necessarily. It's just that um, communication is better. The integrity, the accountability, transparency, those types of things. So, you know, be careful of who you partner with. Um, just because I think this space is getting not saturated, but there's a lot more people that are coming into the space that are new. There's gurus teaching from the stage about how to do this business, which is fine. I love that. I mean, that's how we got into it. We masterminds and mentorships and all those things were great for us. Um, but partnering with people that have the same skill set as you, probably not super smart. Partnering with people that uh, can talk a good game but have zero operational expertise, probably a bad move. So I think just picking your partners slowly, really spending time. Like I would not do a deal with anybody. I didn't get on a plane and at least go out to dinner with and meet their family. And that's a learning curve. That wasn't the first couple of deals that we did, but the cost of a plane ticket and the cost of dinner to go meet their family. My wife, I always like to bring my wife too, if I can. 
Um, just because her intuition about people is, <laughs> is good, right? Our women have good intuition. Um, so that's been kind of the biggest learning curve because the biggest pain points that we've had in our business have been having to buy people out of bad partnerships or having to take losses personally, not to the investors, but because we had to sell a deal early and just to get out of the partnership. So we've, we've only had to do that twice, but they, they were painful times in the business. Right. Well, that, <clears throat> that answers some of the questions because I'm, I'm like, there's a fine line between like, you have to take action. You, some of those things, learning lessons you wouldn't have learned if you didn't actually partner with some of those people. Then you, you, you kind of learn, like I'm, I'm in a lot of LP deals and GP deals and there, there's certain LPs that I probably won't invest with again. And um, it's not necessarily because the returns weren't good. It's just, you know, that's the, one of the beauties about this business, I think, is that you can pick, you know, people that you like to do business with. Yeah, and you absolutely. just, you know, each person just kind of clicks with different people. And so, um, but that's one thing. And then two, some of those things you can't, really see until like you said it earlier until that until you hit the pain point you know and then all of a sudden the true colors come out and and then you're so you know going slower is one action item that you can take going to dinner with their family is another um are there other things that help you kind of make that decision up front versus getting yeah i'd love to talk to some of the other people that they worked with you know, and I know we get to kind of handpick our referrals, but I think having those conversations is an important piece of the puzzle too. And even if you're not, so this is for me as a GP, right? Like when I go yeah. and partner, cause we're, we're going into business together as an LP, you know, I want to know the character of the people that I'm working with, but I'm not involved in the day to day. So, you know, I, I feel like it could probably be a little bit different, but I think GP or LP asking for references from people that have gotten capital back from you, not just invested with you, right? Because, right. oh, yeah, this guy just invested with me six weeks ago. Well, he's in the honeymoon phase yet. He doesn't know what the problems are. Like, who have you gone full cycle with? Give me a couple of references. I like to ask people what their reinvestment rate is. Like, how many of the clients that you've had in the past have reinvested with you? They should kind of know that percentage. I think that's probably a pretty common KPI to track. Like, what's our reinvestment rate? Um, and I think that tells a story. Right? It's like, oh, well, about 80% of the people reinvest with me. Okay, great. Where did the other 20% go? Why do you think they left? And there could be legitimate reasons or not. But asking those types of questions, I think, are always um, just they tell a story. So reinvestment mm -hmm. rate, let's get belly to belly. Let's meet each other's families, talk about core values, and just let people know what deal breakers are for you. Hey, you know, I, you know integrity is one of my core values. If you ask me to lie to the bank, I'm not going to do it. Right. If you ask me to make something seem better than it is to the renovation company, like we're not going to do it. Like we want to find partners that are okay being transparent. That's awesome. Um, I, I love that advice. That that's very helpful. Now, I would what I would add is because if I'm if I'm a brand new person listening, I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't have all that experience. I don't have the you know the turnover. But you could be partnering with somebody that does. You know, most people that get into people the, right. the multifamily syndication world, you, you know, you're not going to win a deal unless you're partnering with somebody that has a good track record. So you could ask those things of that person. And then when you have investors that are asking you, you could say, you could just be transparent. Look, this is my first deal, but I'm partnering with a guy who has had five, five exits. You know, and he's yeah. got a, you know, 90% retention rate on his investor base, you know, so absolutely, you know, that, and that's how you would sell, you know, to your, you know, your network that, you know, Hey, look, you, you're partnered with solid people. And yeah. And I would, so I love that. That's exactly what I 
did in the beginning, right? I mean, we had investors from the single family world, but some people were like, yeah, but you don't have experience over here. And that's why we partnered with people in the beginning was to say, hey, well, they have a lot of experience. So I love that advice. And then if you really want to close the sale, I think just say, hey, I'm also going to get you on the phone with them, right? They're going to talk you through it. And then I have like these two or three character references of people that that I have done business with in the past or I have done this with in the past. I'm going to call my college professor and, you know, whoever it is that can give some character references to because I think that speaks volumes of a person too. Like, okay, so yeah, I appreciate the fact that it's your first deal. We're covering the operation side with this person that has a bunch of experience. But what about the character piece, you know, and then give some character references. I think that would be helpful too. I I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, I've had people ask like, well, what about people you worked with in the past? And and I wasn't even thinking about it, but I'm like, yeah, I've I've got bosses that have invested with me. Well, that you know, says something, right? Yeah. And um so that's that's very cool. Um now you said Sunbelt states, can you define kind of where you guys hone in on? Yeah, we like Texas, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, um, like Arizona. It's just hard to find deals there. Um, basically, we so you know the drivers are economic and population, just like everybody else. It's like where are people moving from? Where are they going to? I'm from Jersey. I landed in South Carolina. There's a reason for that. So, you know, finding people where, finding places to invest where populations are growing and economies tend to follow the people um, are mostly where we like to, to invest. I mean, we didn't, we just got a deal a couple days ago from somebody and it was in like Missouri, I think. And I really like the operator and I really like like everything that they stand for and they give back through their deals and all this other cool stuff. But... I don't know anything about Missouri. So I was right. like, oh, I think we're going to pass on this deal just because I don't know anything about where. I, and and not that we can't underwrite that, right? We can go and find out if those areas are. But it would be the only deal that we had kind of in Missouri. So it's like right. we try to keep them relatively geographically together just so we can go see a few of them at a time. Not to say we wouldn't do a deal like that, but it's just. What's right down the fairway? When we want to start taking risk, I think is when you cut and start making taking making mistakes. It's like, oh, this is a new deal. This is a new area. We don't know anything about it, but let's try it. I think that's when you have some more risk. And and right now we don't have a ton of risk tolerance just because of the economy. Right. So you know, for a lot of us that are in the space, like it's just a no brainer, right? economic drivers, population drivers. But for people that are just getting in, they don't necessarily understand all that. Like it's, it's, you know, investing where you've got wind at your back. You've got people that are moving in. You've got companies that are moving in. You've got jobs that are being created. You've got income that's going up. All of that is in addition to the, you know, partnering with good operators, and, and being in a good area and all that. It's wind at your back. I mean, I saw the difference um, during COVID. Like, you know, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't evict for somebody not paying. Right. Right. But there were people that, like, just skipped out in the middle of the night. Right. And I had a property in Dallas and well, I was south of Fort Worth. And if somebody skipped out, like, we had a line of people that were ready to move in. Right. You know, but if we were in, an, you know, a, an area, a geography where people were moving out to go to other locations, we might not have had the same scenario. Yeah. You know, it might have been hard to replace that person. Yeah. I mean, I we bought a property in Daytona Beach, Florida, just pre-COVID for 42 million bucks. And 18 months later, had a 59 million dollar exit. <laughs> just <laughs> I mean, talk about wind at your back. Like, right. You know, everybody's like, oh, wow, you guys killed it on that deal. And yeah, I mean, we did a great job underwriting it and purchasing it at the right price point. But let's be honest, my three year old would have made money in Florida pre COVID, like, you yeah. know, just because they, they blew up, right? And right. so, but yeah, it's looking the th- at the, the, and the trends were already there. So it's not right. like there were no indicators that we were going right. to do well there. But again, just looking at and understanding those metrics and going, yeah, we have a high likelihood of success here. 
high likelihood of success. But I know I've talked to so many syndicators and like when people are buying a deal, they still are nervous. You know, they're ready to do the deal, but like nobody knows for sure if you're buying, you know, at the top of the market, if the wind's going to keep blowing or if it's good, you're going to yeah. hit a hiccup. Um, and that is the difference, I think, between people that truly get into the sponsorship role and the those that can't is that, you know what, they're, if the sponsors feel like there's a higher likelihood that this is going to go well, then it's going to go bad. And if it goes bad, I'll pivot and figure it out. Where there's other people that they just they just can't pull the trigger. They can't take action. And I think if you're underwriting to today's metrics, right? And you're, I mean, obviously pro formas are based on five year holds and or seven year holds or whatever you're, you're pro forming for. As long as the underwriting is is reasonable, but today's numbers work. Right, like I know that I have a debt service coverage ratio today that my income today will cover the debt today. Um, you know, just just simple things like that. How do I not lose? Right, Warren Buffett says the rule number one about making money is don't lose money. Right. How do I not lose money in this deal? Right, what are the things that can go bad where we're not losing money? I think bridge loans right now are scary for people. Right, you're getting into right. these these resetting loans at double, triple the interest rate that they got initially in at. Like nobody could, nobody predicted that. We didn't know that when you bought a property two and a half years ago or two years ago that interest rates were going to triple. So now what? I mean, now they either have to subsidize it with more equity, getting into a longer term loan, or they have to sell the deal, or you know any number of things. But does the deal carry itself today? Right, I think is number one. Like, can we can we make it work today? And there's guys I know out there doing heavy lifts that are doing bridge loans and. They're comfortable and confident in it, and they have more reps under the bar probably than I do on those heavy turns. Right now, we're just looking for cash flow today, existing cash flow with some economic upside where we know that it's undervalued on the rent. But we know that today, the deal is safe. Long-term debt, today's income based on today's debt service. And then, okay, now are we confident about how we can decrease expenses? I mean, let's, let's not even talk about increasing rents yet. Portfolio wide, is the operator maybe operating at a higher expense ratio than I would be able to in, inside my portfolio? If the answer is yes, then great. There's value right there, and you're you're widening that NOI gap. And then if we can push rents, great. How high? We don't know. Well, we should know based on today's market rate. If there's a gap between today's market rate and where yours is at, then great. We can increase NOIs too. So, I think there's a plenty of reasons to talk yourself out of doing a deal. I right. think especially when you're new, it's yeah. it's very easy to not want to take any of that risk, which again, partnerships, right? Especially if you're newer to the space, having guys that have seen it and have done and it's reps under the bar. The more deals we do, the more confident I am that we'll do deals. It's like, you know, I know one of the questions you like to ask is like, should we stop buying? Should we wait? Should we? Right. No. Never. Like I, you know, good underwriting trumps There waiting. there are syndicators too that are like you know, have pulled back and they're like, I'm waiting for the market to correct. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, the, the talk and I'm sure you hear it all the time is you mentioned the bridge loans that people are waiting for all these bridge loans to come, you know, come due and, you know, operators to be in trouble and they, they're going to have to drop their pants to, you know, and sell at really discounted rates. And that may come or it may not like, so, you know, I, if I'm the operator, I'm doing yeah. a capital call and I'm not selling it to you at a lower basis. Right. I'm going to stay in it, right? We're going to re, re, recapitalize the deal. We're going to reposition it. We'll stay in longer term. Um, you know, and I don't think that people are going to lose money. I think that probably I mean, some people will, right? Always. But sure. I think I think with these resets, I think there's 680 billion of um, of commercial bridge loans coming due in 2023. So I think there's going to be opportunity for sure. But I don't think if I was the guy who bought it two years ago, I don't think I'm taking a loss. I might not be giving the same projected returns to my people, but I don't think my investors are going to be taking equity losses. I think we're just probably not going to make as much as we wanted. But yeah, I think there's opportunity. I would love to be sitting on more cash this year, right? I think I think there will be opportunity there. I think there's already some recaps that I'm seeing uh, in the market that we're getting called for or some institutional 
guys are trying to get their cash off the street. Now, why is that? I, you know, I can only speculate, but I think big hedge funds right now would rather be in a cash position than in a particular real estate position. But here's the good news. Those operators that are calling me and saying, hey, they're liquidating all of their positions. It's almost a billion dollars under management. I'm buy I can buy stuff right now for 20% discounts because I'll get in on the basis that they got in at 18, 24 months ago because I can recap that deal and they have to get out. So there's there's opportunity for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and I encourage people to to recognize that recessions make more millionaires than breaks them. You know, so you just got to be able to recognize the, those opportunities and capitalize on them. Absolutely. Um, well, talk about that, like the fear. Like, you know, are you still afraid? How do you push past fear to get to where you're at? Because that's something that holds a lot of people back. Yeah, I think, I think you have to recognize that, you know, f- fear is a feeling and emotions make terrible masters, but great servants. And you have to recognize that there's fear involved. How do I mitigate that fear? Do I get still get scared? Yeah, of course. I mean, I have a deal closing in 30 days. I have half a million dollars up hard. I'm about 35% into where we need to be for the capital raise. I mean, we just started raising, but it's like, does it, is there a whisper of fear in the back? Like, Hey, you could lose this half a million dollars. Yeah. So how do you push through that? Get around people that have helped you do it before, right? Make sure you're talking about it. I think naming it and claiming it is really important to be like, no, I'm just afraid of this thing and that's all it is and now I can move on. Um, You know, I was talking to my team about this a little bit this morning. Like how do you overcome anxiety and stress and worry? Like worry is worthless. Worry just steals today's joy from today. It doesn't actually help you do anything tomorrow. So what negates fear and what negates worry? Action. Every single time. When I don't feel motivated to go to the gym in the morning, you know what makes me feel like, like, you know what makes me feel better? When I get up, I put my pants on, I go to the gym. (laughs) I don't feel like it until I'm there. But once I'm there, I'm like, oh, cool. And then Jocko Willing talks about this all the time, right? Discipline beats um, motivation every time. I don't feel motivated to pick up the phone and call a bunch of investors today necessarily, but I have a deal to close, right? And once I start getting on the phone and start talking to people and start just having the conversation again, I'm like, okay, I'm over that. That was just my brain being stupid. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I I like you brought up uh, Jocko. Like so, he he was a speaker at the conference that Steve and I were were both at, and um, you know, at the end of his his talk. He went into Q&A and somebody, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but somebody asked him, like, what's your morning routine? And, you know, that's a popular question to ask people who are successful. Like, you know, how do you start your day? What's your routine? And his answer was really interesting to me. It was like, you know what? The alarm goes off. I just go and work out. He's like, I don't think about it. I don't, I don't like have a debate with myself like should i work out should i not work out should i do this first should i do that i just hit the alarm get up go work out yeah and the other thing i wanted to ask you was like when you were back wholesaling like this is interesting to me is that you were doing your first wholesale deal compare that fear to like this deal yeah Man, I'll tell you, I would say the first wholesale deal was scarier. Yes. And I had no money on the line. I mean, I had a $1,000 deposit up to hold the deal, right? right? But it was day 13 of a 14-day due diligence period. And I remember being out with Travis and just like pacing around the dock, like on the water, just trying to get this guy to close and I'm like trying to make concessions and I just I need this deal I need this guy to buy it I don't know what I'm gonna do and I was so stressed out he ended up buying it and now yeah I mean this is a 30 million dollar deal that we're closing in 30 days and it's a 12 million dollar equity raise and I'm not stressed about it it's it's because you've done it over and over and over and it becomes becomes less scary now there's still fear you mentioned that there's still fear but like i had the same thing my first 
investment was a duplex, a new construction duplex, so there wasn't even going to be a lot of maintenance on it. And I w- it was like 50 grand my wife and I were investing in it, and we're getting a loan for the rest. And I was scared to do it because I had never invested in any kind of real estate other than my home. And then I'm, you know, now I'm, you know, wiring 100 grand here and 50 grand there and 75 grand there and then being a GP in this deal and that deal and the other. And like it gets easier. But, you know, for somebody that's looking to just break in, I think like understanding that there's a lot of momentum that can be built after doing your first deal, no matter how small, and, you know, that you gain confidence from going through the process. And and so now yeah. you guys are raising a $100 million fund. Holy cow. I mean, I could maybe talk to you next year, and you guys are raising a $250 million fund or $500 million fund. And, like, you, the next thing you know, you're, you're one of the big, big, big boys, you know? Like, yeah, so I mean, it, we it's had, crazy. We had a guy call us for a $95 million equity check. He's got four deals right now, and one's 95 million equity, one's 27, one's 25. And I literally just said to my team, I was like, look, we're going to fill this $100 million fund up this year. And the next year, we're going to have to probably do a $500 million fund because we're not going to be able to. Because I don't want the size equity check to eclipse the size of the fund, meaning like my maximum on this deal, on this fund would only be a $20 million equity check. Because I want to be able to put at least five diversified deals within that fund. I don't want to have a fund that does two deals, right? Diversification is part of the reason that we started the fund. So it's like, all right, well, all right, let's get to the hundred million by December. And then we'll look at a bigger one next year so that we can do, you know, 30, 40, 50 million dollar equity checks. Because it's the same amount of work, not the capital raise piece of it. That That is, you know, we're still learning how to do more of that on autopilot but the asset management the property management the sponsor management it's the same amount of work on a 66 unit as it is a 980 unit right so let me let me ask you on the on the fund structure though um you know 100 million going to thinking about going to 500 million um are all the investors like your typical high net worth investor credit investors that you'd see in a syndication deal or are you starting to go to family offices and institutional money as well? We haven't gone institutional. Um, I love the retail investor. You know, I would like to do a CF fund next year, which is similar to a reg a, except that you have to be registered with the sec, but it allows you to bring accredited and non accredited together. Um, it's called a reg CF and I really want to do that because when we started this business, the heart was really to help kind of the everyday right. investor get out of Wall Street. And now for this fund, it's accredited. We're, we're doing a 506B single syndication deal um, on a one-off deal because I have a bunch of non-accredited investors still that want to deploy capital with us that can't get in the fund. But yeah, when we started, I mean, you know, we wanted to help the everyday average investor that didn't have access to this type of deal flow, right? Create some generational wealth for them, for themselves and for their families. So, you know, we went the accredited route so that we could do some advertising. But I think the next one that we'll do will be both for five or six, you know, for a sophisticated and accredited investors. Um, because yeah, I, I really think that it's important to give access to deal flow like this to the average American investor. Absolutely. I knew nothing about this until five years ago when I got involved in multifamily. I'm like, I cannot believe that this is a secret. Like you actually have to know somebody to get invited into one of these deals. I'm still blown away. I remember it's, it's, it's it's crazy. I have to get reminded often that, you know, it's, it's become so common knowledge to me that I have to be more curious with potential investors because I just, go down the rabbit hole and talking about depreciation and tax benefits and cash flow. And they're like, wait, you can invest in apartments. And I'm like way down the road. I have to remember that this wasn't common knowledge to me or you or anybody before they got introduced to it. So you just have to make sure you're walking slowly through the halls and and asking (laughs) people like, how much do you know about this? And absolutely. So what, what do you like to do for fun outside of work? 
So I just learned, I just picked up golf. I moved to a beautiful golf course community awesome. here in South Carolina. Um, so I have not golfed, but I started golfing this year and I've dropped my handicap from 30 to 20 in the past nine months or so. So I'm starting to enjoy the game. My wife and I go out and play. We'll walk, you know, nine or 18 holes and get some exercise in together. And it's a nice date on a beautiful golf course. And yeah, I mean, you're so, outside. I So if I come down to the Carolinas, I got a deal in Greenville and a, a deal in, in uh, Spartanburg. So I don't know how far I am from you, but Greenville's um, only about two and a half hours. Spartanburg's a little hours. closer too. Yeah. So we could uh, play some golf. I would, I'd love to get out there. Oh man, I live on these two beautiful Tom Fazio private courses. They're amazing. So anytime you're in town, definitely, uh, definitely, let's go hit some balls. Awesome, awesome. So, hey, if listeners want to learn more about you, um, reach out to you. Like, what's the best way for them to? Yeah. So that? if you go to our website, investingwithpurpose.org. Um, one thing we didn't get to touch on was a little bit yeah. of the impact that we talk, like to, talk about uh, that before we end because. Because we did say we were going to talk about it, but we didn't. Um, so Yeah, so, well, that website does a great job of explaining it. But essentially, um, the why behind our business, like the real big reason that we do what it is that we do is we have been giving an ever-increasing percentage of company profits away through our donor-advised fund. And we now fund over 27 nonprofit uh, ministries and different nonprofits around the world. Uh, just last year, funded over 27 of them. Over 100,000 people were served, and you know that that's just an incredible um, feeling for us and our team. 100,000 people, and that is, you know, some 9,000 children getting fed every month. That is uh, some 40,000 people getting fresh water through a dug that we a well that we dug in Western Africa. We actually um, bought a van and funded uh, bulletproof vests and blankets for Ukrainian refugees when Russia um, a pastor called us that we knew and said, hey, I'm, I'm driving people out of this war zone and I need a van. I need more vans. Um, I need bulletproof vests. And I didn't have an idea of where to get bulletproof vests. So I called up another nonprofit and I knew that this guy used to um, be special forces and now he runs a nonprofit. And I said, hey, do you know where we could get bulletproof vests and I said he's got bulletproof vests but the lead time's like four weeks and the invasion's going on right now what do we do and within three days he had a container ship filled with bulletproof Holy vests cow. and bulletproof blankets to wrap kids in in these vans running them through this war zone to get them out so just amazing amazing um, nonprofits that are on the front lines around the world that we get to fund and we started you know through some prayer going like Lord how do I get to give more abundantly before I make it right before I financially make it. And, uh, we just, he just said, you know, let's partner on every deal. We'll do 1% of this next deal. The economic benefit of this deal will go towards your donor advised fund and we'll start funding nonprofits. And now that number is well over 10%. And wow. every deal that we do, we try to push that number up. Our big, hairy, audacious goal is to give 80% of our net company profits away oh, through the God. donor advised fund. And uh, that doesn't affect investor returns, but they get to partner with us on those really cool things. We send monthly newsletters out about all the nonprofit work that is getting done because people have decided to invest with us. And it's been uh, it's been incredible to watch it grow. That's huge. And look, I mean, for you, I've I've interviewed a lot of other people that have become wealthy through, you know, these real estate deals. And, you know, this is what I tell listeners is that Look, in the beginning, you just are trying to figure out how can I create wealth for my family? Absolutely. Right? And then and then the second piece of it comes in where all of a sudden your network says, Hey, I saw you do it. Can you help me? And then all of a sudden you start helping other people grow their wealth. And then the people that have been in the business for a while and they really have have made it. Then they really start having excess funds to have to do impact stuff, to like to to touch pe more and more people around the world, and so this is just another example of that, and that's um, very admirable that you you guys are doing that. Yeah, we love it, and it builds an amazing company culture. I mean, we know we know what we're doing it for, 
right? We know that um, urgent needs arise all the time, and we want to make sure that we're ready and willing and able to give when the opportunity arises. So, and uh, yeah, it's been really cool. And our partners, our investor partners join us too. They say, hey, I saw that cool thing that you were given to can I give to your donor advised fund as well? And it's tax deductible. They get additional tax benefits through don't through putting money through our donor advised fund. And, and then, yeah, it just goes out to wherever the greatest need is. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, well, listeners, I hope that you enjoyed what that one, uh, Steve, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I look forward to seeing you at the next conference, and uh, I would like to get out and play some golf. If you're heading out to South Carolina, definitely hit me up. We'll, we'll go out and hit some links. All right. Sounds good. And listeners, until next week, sign off. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com learn. 